I'm Professor Steve Rowe. I'm a real paleontologist, and you're watching Real Paleontology. And today in my Super Predator series, we are going back, way, way back in time, half a billion years in fact, to a scene of carnage, terrible trilobite carnage. Our mission? To establish the identity of the killer, and by implication, maybe the world's first confirmed super predator. We have the bodies of the victims and meticulous documentation of the ghastly injuries inflicted upon them. We have identified our suspects and amassed what the prosecution, that's me, believes to be convincing evidence of guilt in the form of sophisticated biomechanical simulation and fossilised crap. So sit back and stay tuned for a Cambrian murder mystery. It's a tough one. Cold cases don't come much colder than this. But before I lay out the case, I need to point out that most of the evidence I'm about to present was collated and published by Dr. Russell Bicknell and Prof. John Patterson in this 2022 publication. I'll also point out that I know Russell and John well. John and I were supervisor and co-supervisor of Russell's through his PhD at the University of New England in Armadale. Russell smashed his PhD and then a postdoctoral position at UNE before going on to even bigger and better things. He's now at the American Museum of Natural History in New York and the recipient of a highly prestigious fellowship. Anyway, let's set the scene of the crime, or should I say multiple crimes. The time is the early Cambrian, around 520 million years ago. The place is what we now call Emu Bay, situated on Kangaroo Island off the coast of South Australia. And the evidence has been collected from a geological formation called the Emu Bay Shale here. Now, the Emu Bay Shale is world famous for its diverse and abundant lineup of weird Cambrian animals. But as with so many Cambrian assemblages, far and away the greatest component comprises the fossilized remains of trilobites. Trilobites, of course, were an extraordinarily successful and diverse group of arthropods, that is, animals with jointed legs and hard exoskeletons. All trilobites share the same basic body plan, a head, a thorax, and a pygidium at its back end here. Here we have some 3D imaging of a beautifully preserved trilobite from Morocco, showing its anatomy in awesome three-dimensional detail. Anyway, John Patterson's been studying this emu bay fauna for years, describing new species and dishing out important new insights. But what had grabbed his attention in this instance was the fact that many emu bay trilobites had chunks taken out of them. And there was other intriguing evidence embedded in this emu bay shale, coprolites, that is, fossilised crap. And in this fossilised crap were the remains of trilobites. Clearly, something was eating the trilobites of Emu Bay, and eating a lot of them. Here's a pic of a trilobite death scene, and even in this one relatively tiny sample, a whole bunch of them had pieces removed. Of course, evidence of eating isn't necessarily evidence of predation. It could just be that something was scavenging on already dead trilobites. However, in a good number of cases, these terrible injuries showed signs of healing, which obviously means that they must have been alive when attacked. This has to be predation. So, who or what was doing the killing? Well, suspect number one was this weird and very suspicious looking character. Already well known to the authorities, as you might say, and I'm sure that many of you too are already familiar with this bizarre looking beast, Anomalocaris, often touted as the super predator of its day, the Cambrian killing machine. And we know it was there in Emu Bay. So let's check out its specs. John was already very familiar with this beast. For example, he had demonstrated in this 2011 paper that Anomalocaris had surprisingly sophisticated compound eyes, as good as, if not better, than the eyes of any living arthropod. And by Cambrian standards, it was huge, up to half a metre long. Anomalocaris might look weird, but it is so in a very menacing kind of way. It looks the part, fast and streamlined, 
with these ginormous, wicked-looking spiked appendages at its front end. It certainly gives off a sinister vibe. And what about its mouth? Well, its mouth was kind of unusual. It's something we call an oral cone. It's a feature shared with its close relatives, a group called radiodonts. It comprised a series of plates arranged in a circle, kind of reminiscent of a camera shutter. Now, no one's really quite sure how this oral cone worked, but it's pretty clear now that in Anomalocaris, these plates were not very hard. So it seems highly unlikely that they could have been used to crunch and grind through the thick exoskeleton of a trilobite. And probably the most widely accepted interpretation is that the oral cone acted as a pump to suck food in. And it's damn hard to see how it could have inflicted the kind of damage we see on those emu bay trilobites with a little vacuum cleaner. It's damn hot down here down under at the moment, pushing 100 degrees Fahrenheit in the old money. So I'm going to go for a quick dip. I'll see you back here in a minute. That's much better. Now, Anomalocaris obviously didn't just have a mouth. It had those really big, spiky, scary-looking frontal appendages. What the hell were those about? Now, I'm not an invertebrate paleontologist by trade. I generally prefer my animals with backbones. But I've got to admit that if ever there was a sexy invertebrate, Anomalocaris is it. So when Russell and John asked me if I'd like to assist with a biomechanical analysis of the Cambrian super predator, I didn't have to think twice. Our objectives here were to build a three-dimensional computer model of its raptorial spiked appendages and see what they could do. Could Anomalocaris have used these to capture and crush its prey into bite-sized chunks that it could then suck up with its oral cone? The method we used is a computer-based approach called finite element analysis, first developed back in the 1950s for the aerospace industry. Some overseas colleagues also chipped in with a related approach called computational fluid dynamics. The objective here was to determine the effect on its swimming efficiency when it swam with its appendages contracted as opposed to extended. We published our results in this paper here. What did we find? Well, we found that these appendages had a wide range of motion, which means that they would have been useful for capturing prey of varying sizes. But we also found that these nasty looking spikes called endites would have been way too brittle to have been used to perforate or crush the heavily calcified exoskeletons of trilobites. In short, Anomalocaris was a soft prey specialist. It just didn't have what it takes to crunch through a trilobite. And interestingly, the analysis of fluid dynamics here showed that they mostly swam with these big frontal appendages extended before them, rather than contracted and curled up, which is how they have typically been reconstructed. Anyway, bottom line is, we can be pretty darn sure that it wasn't Anomalocaris who was going around taking big chunks out of trilobites and leaving further incriminating evidence in the form of trilobite bits and pieces in its poo. So, who was? And before we address this question directly, I'd like to draw your attention to another paper we published in 2021. In this paper, we applied finite element analysis to the feeding appendages of two species of trilobite, Redlichia rex and Olenoides serratus, another extinct Cambrian arthropod called Sydnia, and a living species that I'm sure most of you are familiar with the horseshoe crab. Now, these species are all arthropods, but aside from the two trilobites, none of them are particularly closely related to each other. But they all do share something in common, nathobases. These are basically hard and spiky tooth-like projections at the base of modified legs. And we know that the living horseshoe crab uses these very effectively to crush and grind its way through the hard protective shells of things like bivalve mollusks. And it doesn't take a great leap of imagination to envisage trilobites doing the same with their nathobases. And as it turns out, the results of our finite element analysis here were very much in agreement with this hypothesis. Interestingly, they also showed that one of these extinct species was especially well adapted to crunch and grind its way through thick, hard shells or exoskeletons. This was Radicilia rex. Let's just call him rex. 
Now, a quick background check reveals that Mr. Rex was not your average everyday trilobite. The first thing you notice about Rex is that he's big, really big. At up to 30 centimetres or around 12 inches long, Rex was easily the biggest trilobite Australia has ever seen. Admittedly, not quite as big as Anomalocaris, but definitely packing higher calibre firepower. The trilobite king had the right kind of kit to wreak the kind of carnage we can see among the lesser trilobites of Emu Bay. And we know Rex was there at the scene of the crime. Now, admittedly, this is, of course, an entirely circumstantial case. We know Rex was there. We know he was the only one with the weaponry that could have done it. And he clearly had motive. Maybe he wouldn't be convicted in a court of law, but I'm sure convinced that he'd done it. One last rather disturbing fact. Some of these badly mauled trilobites were of the same species. It seems that big rexes were eating little rexes. And I'm going to leave it at that rather sad, sombre note. I hope you enjoyed this little video, and if you did, please like and subscribe. I'll be back next week.